very happy to have Larry Friedman here. He wrote the book on Diamond Joe Reynolds, very fascinating subject, uh, little known about the man before, and just brings to life the whole steamboat era, and just love Larry's friendly manner and all his personal anecdotes in there, in this book. Very fun to read. Uh, to many of you, Larry needs no introduction. And a member of the Dubuque community for a long time, many years, worked at the Friedman Insurance Group for 40 years, the business his father started, was president for nine, won the prestigious uh, Telegraph Carol First Citizen Award in 1999 for all his efforts and everything he gave back to the community. Happy to have Larry here. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm not really a writer. I'm a storyteller. That's what my children always said. They got me interested in doing a little writing. So they kept asking me, Dad, why don't you put those stories to you so we can go over them sometime when we're older. So I started taking a computer course, and I was so bad. Sister said, you'll never write a, a book by the way you type. So uh, she agreed to uh, do the typing for me if I would write it every week. And this came out my first memoirs, uh, Larry's memoirs. And it was taken during the Depression. And I tell some Depression stories there. A photographer came door to door and talked my mother out of $2. And that's how I got the book. Uh, some of the stories I tell about during the Depression, uh, things are very rough. And my older brother, had tonsillitis, really bad. And I, my dad knew a doctor, and the doctor said, I'll take it out in your kitchen table if you do the ether. <laughs> so it worked out real good. My brother's tonsil came out. My dad said, how much for two? He said, $10. My dad got me out of bed and got lost my tonsil, two for $25. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So that's how I got started on my first book. Uh, the second book, A.A. A. Cooper Reinvents the Wheel. Uh, my wife, Brittany, was a historian. And I heard her tell the story about Cooper so many times that I thought, see, I think I'll write about it. So I did ask uh, Kate Fish if she would help me put it together, and she did. And it's a great story. If you remember, he's a boy, 17, he's leaving home. He gets on a boat in Davenport, and he's going to go to St. Paul where he can get a job. And he was about five miles from Dubuque. He was watching two gamblers gamble. One of them took a gun out to go to shoot his buddy and missed and hit Cooper on the foot. That's why they took him, out, took him off the boat in Dubuque, Iowa. He was taken in by a man who had a little a boundary, and that house that he was taken into was on 2nd and Locust. And that's the little house you see when you go up to Eagle Point Park on the right side. That's where he grew up. And he ends up marrying uh, the man that took him in, uh, his niece. He was uh, married by Bishop Lawrence. That, so that's a great story about Cooper. Okay. Um, on Diamond Joe Reynolds, um, one of my hobbies is collecting postcards. It seems like every time I went looking for a postcard, uh, there was a story on, on Joel Reynolds. So with that, I thought I'd try uh, with a good auditor that I would write the story on Diamond Joe Reynolds. I don't know when I'd be better off up the side. Can I have to wait that way? Have my body view? Yeah, that's Diamond Joe's River music. Funny thing, Diamond Joe would not permit any gambling or drinking on his boat. And when they start, start to get, get a name, Fellow named Diamond Joe, and that's how we got the Diamond Joe uh, gambling place here in the view. 
Um, the first thing I did when I went looking for Joe Reynolds was see where he lived in Butte. And I went through all the dictionaries and everything down the library, found that Diamond Joe Reynolds never made his home in Butte. Even though he had his headquarters here, uh, he stayed at the Julian. Joe uh, Reynolds was born in uh, Fallsburg, New York, which is Upper New York, a rural area. He was the youngest of six children, and uh, his grandfather is quite famous. Uh, maybe I'll get started on that. Um, This is his grandfather's house in Upper New York, rural area, and he's quite famous because he was a Quaker, and he did not involve himself in the Revolutionary War, but he had groceries and he would help feed the troops. And there's a group called the, the Tories that were still very loyal to England. And this is where the grandfather Henry lived. The, after the war, the Tories were still very bitter about the revolution, and they came to get Henry Reynolds, and his 12-year-old uh, daughter stopped them from killing him. They already had the, the rope around his neck, and she fought him off, and they finally left. And so there's a, um, there is this sign on the highway as you go by, Reynolds' house. Outlaws attacked and attempted to murder patriot Henry Reynolds, who was saved by his heroics of his daughter, uh, Fiji. So that's kind of a little background on the, on the family. Uh, when I was young, I only knew two diamonds, nothing with Diamond Joe. One was Diamond's Cafeteria. Do, do you remember Diamond's Cafeteria? 1982. One of my favorite five. The other was the, the Diamond House. Diamond House was on Julian Avenue, uh, which is now University Avenue, and on an Easter Sunday, a, a Union Electric trolley came down, and tried to turn on Hill Street, and took the diamond off the Diamond House. But as kids, we always called this house the Diamond House because it came to a point. After that, they rebuilt it. Right now, it's uh, that building is gone, and there's billboards there. I already told you I was a postcard collector, and some of the the active postcards were the Diamond Joe line, and everybody was trying to get postcards because they made everybody that uh, is a collector collect the Diamond Joe line. Anybody know where this would be? Ice Harbor. Ice Harbor. Good. Before we had frozen ice, they would cut ice at the harbor, and then a hundred pound groups and team of horses that would haul them up to the ice houses with sawdust, and that's what we had for ice for the whole year. The next step after this one is they got power saws, and they could saw the uh, ice harbor in uh, ice in a hundred pound scale, very nice. And along came a man named Fisher. And he was in New York at a convention, and he said, all the dealers there told him, you're not still using river water, are you? So he came back to Duke, and he built the Fisher Ice House. And by doing that, he put all, all the other ice companies out of business because he, it was city water, and you could get chips off of it. Um, when I was young, I can remember my mother's father putting a sign on the window, so when the ice man came, he, he could chop whatever amount he wanted. When he went in to deliver the ice, we used to jump on the truck and get the ice cube for us. So that was a real treat there for the freshman year. You can see this is what the ice harbor used to look like. It became the city's only skating rink. And the city also um, rented out both houses along the river. When high water came, they were flipping all over. In the background, 
if you see the Brahmas diamond line, they brought the boats into the harbor at winter time. You just say that when the spring came and the ice came, they would just ruin all the, the river boats. So the city made a contract with them. They could take their three big boats, uh, the Quincy, the St. Paul, and the Dubuque, into the ice harbor, and they uh, made room for them. Once in a while, the, the city made a deal, said you can use the harbor, if you like, but you'll have to have so many men hired. And it was just right for Reynolds because he then started the, the uh, Diamond Joe Line Boathouse, boat building, and that was on Lincoln Avenue. At that time, Lincoln Avenue extended right all the way to the river, and, and Romberg must have started maybe at the waterworks. So you can see that was the only ice skating rink in the city at the time. Here's another view. You can see the shot tower there, and you can see all the people skating. In the back was the only interstate power building. Wintering in the Duke Harbor, there again you can see the Reynolds Diamond Joe line in, in the harbor. So it was protected once March came. This is uh, when uh, Cooper, we didn't have much information on him when he was a boy. He, he lived uh, two things. One when uh, there was an army base up near where they lived, and his brother made it. Uh, the people were allowed to uh, sell their items at the army show. And his brother built donuts, and they found that another man had donuts. And uh, Joe Reynolds went out, took donuts into the stands, and they sold out way before the brothers came. Uh, then there's the story of his uh, pocket knife. He was ice fishing as a boy. And he was digging into the ice, and his favorite pocket knife fell down into the water. Said, oh my God. So he went on home, got an axe. He chopped a big hole. He went down into the water and found it. And he caught uh, his knife. Later on in life, he said, that trip in the water caused me to have rheumatism and arthritis. And he, it was very hard for him to walk after that. Um, Diamond Joe never intended to run a boat line. He, um, he lived and moved to Chicago. Uh, by the meantime, he got married. He was 37 and his wife was 32. And, but he moved to Chicago and became a great dealer. So he got familiar with Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois. And this is where he buys grain and then ships it to Chicago. Became quite successful. One of the problems was the shipping company always took his grain last and all the other uh, grain dealers got the higher price for the grain, and he got <laughs> the lowest near the end. So he decided he would build his own boat. And he built it, it was about a 70 or 80 feet foot long boat. And he used it for one year, and he got pretty good prices. And then the shipping company came to him and said, we'd like to buy your boat. Otherwise, you'll use it for a month, and it sits for a whole year. So he sold his boat back to them, and they promised him that he would ship his goods first, his uh, grain first. Well, they didn't hold up to the truth, and the next year he got mad and he bought another boat. And he was doing pretty well, and they were fighting him more in their shipping charges. So he bought the second boat, and that went pretty good. So now he was getting great prices for his grain, making all kinds of money, and he started then charging other people this is the boat I built back here. This is the grain mill that he and his brother owned before he moved to Chicago. This is still armor. Does anybody remember the armor meat packing plant, Chicago big plant? Well, he got um, Reynolds started buying uh, furs and skins, and he would be gone one place and Armor would be another. So finally, the, and the prices for skins went very low. 
So that they got together and said, let's draw a card. One will buy the other out. So happens that Diamond Joe won double armor, then started the armor meat patent. They became great friends in Chicago. Later on, they got into a, a deal together. Okay. So, Diamond Joe started two companies, as I told you. One was the regular freight line, and the other one was repairing boats. And this was his boat building and, and repair shop was on Lincoln Avenue, right at the very end where the river came in to the city. Here's the one of the boats that hit a stump or something. All the passengers are, are leaving. This is the Eagle Point boat yard. Uh, it has a Lincoln Avenue address. It just shows um, he had as many, many as 200 people working for him at one time. Not only did he build his own boats, but he also did a boat repair deal, and it was the only one on the Mississippi between St. Paul and St. Louis. This shows um, when Diamond Joe got into the hauling grain, he found out there was a need for a passenger line. So what he did, he, he would buy a barge and take the things he needed to haul, the grain and so forth, and just push it from one city to the other. And as he got growing, the passenger line business became great, and the cargo business became less because the railroad came in and uh, stole most of his business, and they hauled the grain the whole year round. Each, each boat that he bought was bigger than they was before that. You can see they're getting larger and larger all the time. This is his warehouse in St. Louis. To show you how big it was, this is where the passenger line can get the tickets, and this was the warehouse for him um, in St. Louis. He ended up having um, over 60 bases where you could get a ticket as a passenger and even haul things. Now, this is the St. Paul. He ends up with three very large boats. The St. Paul, you can see now, three deckers. And uh, it went from St. Paul to St. Louis. The next, um, this is the, the, the boat Quincy. Quincy was the next one built. Um, very famous. It was go to the boat that is named after Quincy, Illinois. Very, there's more postcards on the Quincy than any other boat that I, I think I have uh, 10 or 15 postcards of the Quincy. That's the signal when Diamond Joe's boat is coming into town. Two longs and two short. When the people um, heard those sounds, they would get their tickets ready to come on board and whatever cargo was needed. They could hear that about at least a half mile down the river. This, um, let me put this in back now. If you go to the Hotel Julian on the lower lobby where the restaurant is, the same ad that is on here for the Diamond Joe is at the cathedral in the big frame. I think it could be. I didn't see that until after the book was written. This is um, this shows how long his line was all the way from St. Louis on the bottom to St. Paul on the top. Um, it would take eight days to go from Dubuque to St. Paul, seven days to go from Dubuque to St. Louis. The fares, you probably can't read them very well. One 
the trip to St. Paul for $8, and that's included all the meals. The trip to uh, St. Louis was $7, because it was a day uh, charter. Uh, round trip was around $15 for, uh, if you wanted to go from the Duke journey. These are all the different spots where you, you could buy a ticket uh, all along the line. Anybody recognize this building? Okay, it's the uh, the warehouse today of, of the the line. Um, uh, what's the name of the Marine Service? Uh, you, you, yeah, that's right, Marine Service. That's the building that Simon Joe built, and it's on the National Register. And that's the building where you could get your tickets. So forth. Um, very busy, busy yesterday. Where was that building located? It was on the south side of the harbor, on the opposite side, where um, um, Mokru Oil was there and Fisher Oil Company was there. It was on the other side of the harbor. And that's, that's where it is today. Um, I don't know why this picture is there. It's too early. Uh, after Simon Joe, um, was very successful in the boat business. Had more money than he knew what to do. And he wasn't feeling very good. So his doctor said, why don't you go to um, and take to do the hot spring and stay there for a month, maybe you get better. So he takes off for uh, hot springs and he, the railroad stops at uh, Mount Burn, Arkansas. Which is 22 miles from um, the um, hot springs. So he has to get a rig, gets on a, a stagecoach there, and it's very rough. He says, really tough time getting there. And then it breaks down about a mile from hot springs. And he had to walk the last mile to get there. When he got there, he was very unhappy. He went to the manager and he said, You've got to have a better job than that. And I got in a little argument. Guy said, if you don't like the next time you can walk your 22 miles. But Diamond Joe got kind of mad about it. And he bought some property and found out he could build a railroad. It took one year to build a, a railroad from uh, Melbourne to Hot Springs. And this, it was the small gauge railroad. And it became very, very popular. And it, he charged 10 cents a mile. And it was the only way then people could get to Hot Springs. One year, he, he uh, made um, over $1,000 for that month. So he was doing very, very well. <laughs> and he, had, he made a lot of money on this railroad. And then the big railroad came in and they said, well, why don't you increase your track to make the normal um, railroad crossing? And so that the the Pullman cars coming from the east to go to Hot Springs could use his railroad track. And they didn't have to get out of their railroad cars. They could go right on. He made a fortune doing that. Um, I got a little bit ahead of myself when um, Bill Reynolds and his wife moved to McGregor, Iowa. And uh, they then uh, had a boy named Blake. He was educated in McGregor, but uh, Park, um, Bill Reynolds then wanted him to, to go to uh, one of the Eastern universities, so got him in at Harvard, I'm sure that took a little money. And he didn't finish at Harvard, so I didn't do that. So after he got a little older, <coughs> Reynolds said, how would you like to run the, the boat line? So he hired a man for one year to go with him and Blake finally told his dad, he said, uh, Dad, I, I'm not in the boat business. I, I, I'm not interested. He said, okay, would you be interested in running the railroad? His son, no. He said, that looks like hard work. I don't want that. So he just kind of drifted. He went to Cuba. He went to Europe. He was out in California, where he ended up dying at age 28. But before he died, he told his dad, he said, I'm kind of interested in mining. Here there's a lot of gold. And, uh, 
So John and Joe looked into it, and a man told him he could buy a mine for $25,000, which is probably um, worth today's value, that would be about three, three million. And he bought it, and he found out that the man that sold it to him had planted gold on the wall, and he lost them, couldn't get anything for it, it was gone. So instead of going home and crying about it, he did some inquiry, and he found out that he could buy a, this mine for $60,000. It was a very rich mine, but it was 40 miles away from any major city. So he uh, bought it anyhow, found out that it was probably the richest mine at that time in the state. He did some work, built the road up so he could take it into uh, a place where they did the crushing. That was too slow yet, so he bought his own crusher. But that particular mine was, at that time, the most valued mine in, in, um, in Arizona. Diamond Joe was not feeling well, and uh, he went to it. He would visit the mine and then the railroad. And he got pneumonia and he, when he arrived at the, his mine, and he told the people there um, that he had not made a will. So he told one of his workers to go in the town and bring a lawyer and bring a doctor. And he told one of the other employees, um, I didn't make a will, why don't you start writing? So he wrote down all his assets, all the things that he owned, and uh, he got it all ready, and he died before he could sign the will. Um, the, then uh, he was buried in, uh, in Chicago, where his son had died, and we can never figure out why he buried his son in Chicago until we saw the receipt uh, that his property that he owned when he died. And he owned half the cemetery. So that's why he is um, buried in that same cemetery alongside of his um, son. This is some one of his workers coming in the mine. Like I said, he bought a crusher so he could take that gold and get it crushed and just pretty much great deal. He saved a lot of money. He said if he would have lived longer, he would have built his own railroad from the mine into the spot where he could sell it. That's Arizona, right? Arkansas. Oh, no, Arizona, right. Mm -hmm. um, this is Diamond Joe Reynolds. Uh, he had a beard. He was a gentleman. When he, a lot of times, he never actually uh, was a pilot or Boat, but he used to come as a as a worker, and he dressed in overhauls. One day he was working on one of the boats, and the lady that was in the cabin started talking to him. And she, that night she went to dinner, and she sat with the captain. And she said, "I'm amazed that your worker are so knowledgeable about the river." He said, "When well, he ought to, he owns all <laughs> This is. The Reynolds Building in Chicago. When he died, he had a, he made a wish that he would help educate young people. And so he gave uh, he listed two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is about five million today, uh, to the Chicago University. And this is the building they built in his name, called the Reynolds Building. This is it when you go in the building. This is what it says here. Builder of metal wrap, trader, miner, master of transportation. This love for sons like Reynolds, who he died in, in youth. Widening the gorgeous interest of all young men led to the erection of this building. That's right in the inside building as you go in. Um, he gave them more money than he needed, and they had another 50000 for scholarships for boys. This is his home at McGregor, Iowa. He lived on the second floor, and he owned the grain business on the first floor. And you see uh, in the middle here, this fountain was named after Blake, 
This is the main dragon of Regular Island. This is what it looked like uh, until a storm came along and then they had to rebuild it about three years ago. So this is the advertising in 1876 to Diamond Joe Line. It was the only passenger line between St. Paul and uh, St. Louis. So that's the story of Don Joe Anybody have any questions? Uh, just a kind of a timeline with Rach. When was he engaged in the steamboat operation? And within that, sub, I guess, subcontent or subject, when was the grain business and then when was the passenger business? See, he never intended to get into the passenger business, but when the railroads came in, they were stealing most of his grain shipping. So that's when he decided rent. He started out real slow at first, and he kept buying bigger boats and bigger boats. He never intended to get into the passenger line. Uh, that, that the railroads forced him to do that. I understand. I was wondering what time period that would be. Right. Well, um, he. Um, Died in 1919, 19, 19, in uh, 1880, 80, 89, 90, see those years. But he never had any speed boats. His boats were big passenger line boats. Uh, one, uh, the Quincy had 75 cabins to it. Uh, the Dubuque boat was called the honeymoon boat. Oh. And people could buy their honeymoon tickets here in Dubuque, go to La Crosse or uh, St. Paul, or they can go down south. And he could leaving him off about every 30, 40 miles, he had to stop, like Bellevue and so forth. He, he had 60 different locations where you could buy your tickets. Any questions? Uh, oh, no, I'm that was I was curious about the time also, about okay. when he passed away. Mm -hmm. yeah. He lived 71 years. Oh, 71. He, died in, he died in the cabin, um, in the gold mine cabin. Doctor, they had a storm, and the doctor and the lawyer never did make it. He died before they could get there. But he had it all written out, but he died before he could sign it. And his wife took over and did everything that he had down on the list. Do you know if there was any connection between his operation up there by the point and the Dubuque boat and boiler works? Yeah, um, they, they provided the boilers for his boats that he built up there. Mm -hmm. So the framing was done at the boat um, deal, and he bought his, his boilers from, um, before the Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works, um, and I'm blank here now, there was another boiler works that before that, and that's where he bought the boilers when he built his boats. Oh, because my grandfather worked down at the Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works, he was the tool guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. He had all the tools. Yeah, they came yeah. later. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of the first Bought it worked company in the big town. They got it someplace, but I can't recall the name right now. Yeah. Okay. And I believe they have some of the tooling for that, those big punches and so forth. Yeah. Down yeah. The yeah. When you go through the museum, you can see all, all those doors. parts from the new boat and boiler works. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. they're dealing with some very heavy steel plates. Yes, right. They did the, the boilers and that type of work. And when obviously, it, historically, there, there was some benchmark, obviously, when the railroads put the Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and they could haul it cheaper than he could and faster. So that's why he got into the passenger line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he made more money in that than he ever did on the, doing uh, the I couldn't help but notice his picture of the boat on whatever kind of docking they all put braces up there. Mm -hmm. It looks like a Roman war galley <laughs> with the oars, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ben Hur, that was a good sign. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I said. Uh, whenever you were coming into shore, you would do the two long and the two short. Yeah. They knew it was his line and get your uh, suitcases ready to well, come. Well, like the railroad, they got some kind of code that, that you know, as a meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. The story of Diamond Joe. Yeah. You know, Larry, thanks. Uh, you, you had mentioned that uh, Lake we used to run all the way out to the river. Yes. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I was researching an old house right now, and uh, fruit in the people's hand was fruit. And, um, the Fruit and Lumber Company? 
Yeah, I was related to that. There was a movement in Dubuque to build a, a channel from, like, like an inland channel uh -huh. from the point area to Piazza Channel down to Gravity Slough. Like it was, like it was separated from, sometimes you see pictures of the shot tower out in the water. Like there was something, did you ever hear much about that, the movement to build a inland channel that was off the Mississippi? Yeah, there. Um, the, the one I'm thinking about, it was, there was an island where they used to take the boat across there and have all their parties and so forth. Are you thinking of that? Yeah. Okay, that's the only one I'm familiar with. Okay, thank you, Carl, for coming. Thank you.